One sunny day in March, long ago, a young boy stood by the gates of the Austin Motor Company. Most days after school he stood there. He liked cars best in all the world. This day his eyes widened because this car was different. It was blue with a black hood and four brass lamps. But what made it so different was the curly brass horn bolted to the windscreen. That car's for me, he shouted, and the men laughed. It is the only car for me, he thought. But as he was only seven, he could do nothing about it. He walked home in a dream. Weeks later, Gumdrop was amongst all the other new cars in the showroom. A grand lady sailed in. I am the Lady Mayoress, and I want a car in which I shall look my best. She stopped in front of Gumdrop. What a magnificent motor, and it matches my dress to perfection. So she bought Gumdrop. Later that year, Gumdrop appeared in the Lord Mayor's procession. Soon, it started to rain, so the chauffeur stopped to put the hood up. My new hat! It will be ruined! screamed the Lady Mayoress. She was so upset about the hat that she decided to sell Gumdrop and get a saloon car. So Gumdrop was for sale again. One day, a small car drew up with Mr and Mrs Septimus Bunch and their five children. They wanted a bigger car. Look at that! they cried when they saw Gumdrop. It was big enough too, so Mr Bunch bought Gumdrop. It took the children to school, it took Mrs Bunch to the shops, and it took Mr Bunch to town. Best of all, it took the whole family on holidays. They drove it up mountains, picnicked in shady woods, and went down to the seaside. Eventually the children grew so big they had to squeeze into Gumdrop and even push him up the steep hills. So in the end Mr Bunch had to sell him for an even bigger car. Freddy Bracegirdle bought him next, and he was a fireman. One day, all the fire engines were out, when they had yet another call. What shall we do? the station commander said. Hitch the trailer pump to my car, cried Freddy. Gumdrop got them to the fire in no time, and the fireman put it out. Very well done, said the station commander. We'll use Gumdrop again when needed. Gumdrop became very special. Everyone knew him because he was blue, not red, and they cheered when he flashed past. Gumdrop stood by bravely as the fireman fought the flames. He had many adventures, but eventually the station bought new fire engines and there was no more work for him. Freddy had another car and so he sold Gumdrop. The station commander gave Gumdrop a special badge to thank him. He was now an old car and somewhat battered. He was called Old Croc or The Heap. A grocer, Mr Peabody Parsnip, now owned him, but he was worried what people might think when they saw such an old car at their smart front doors. A year later, he bought a new van and sold Gumdrop to Farmer Clodbury. Gumdrop worked hard at the farm. He would bring in hay from the field and carry timber for the fences. On Saturdays, young Giles Clodbury would give himself driving lessons round the meadow. One day, Farmer Clodbury had no more use for Gumdrop, drove him to an old barn and left him. The hens were very happy, though, and laid their eggs on Gumdrop's comfortable seats. Meanwhile, Gumdrop sagged more and more and more and began to rust away. One day, a scrap merchant called Charlie Mead happened to see Gumdrop in the barn. Farmer Clodbury was hard up and so he sold Gumdrop for scrap. Off you go to the breaker's yard tomorrow, said Charlie. Early next morning, a man came into the scrapyard. He saw Gumdrop and stared. That's an Austin Heavy 12-4 and I bet it's blue under that dirt. And it's still got the brass horn, he said excitedly. I think it's the one I remember as a small boy. I'll buy it. He did remember, and now he was none other than Mr Josiah Oldcastle, and he had dreamt about Gumdrop for all of those years. I would like to try the engine, he said. They fitted in a new battery and put in oil, petrol and water. Then Mr Oldcastle pressed the starter button. The engine started first time. There's no doubt about it. This is my old gumdrop. He could hardly wait to pay Charlie. He pumped up the tyres and settled in the driving seat. And with a grateful wave to Charlie, he drove gumdrop home.
It was holiday time in Cornwall and the traffic was very heavy. Suddenly there was the sound of a klaxon horn, followed by a honk honk horn. As people turned to look, they saw the car with the two horns. It was an Austin Clifton Heavy 12-4. It was gumdrop. Mr Oldcastle was on holiday too. He drove to the quayside and switched off the engine. He then went down to the ferry to take him to the castle across the bay. Now, when an old vintage car is left alone, it doesn't stay that way for long. People admire it. Children touch it with sticky hands, and even other cars stop to look. The two men from this car looked all over Gumdrop. They even lifted the back seat and seemed to rummage around under it. There is no end to the curiosity of enthusiasts. At length, Mr Oldcastle returned and drove off. They were not far up the road when a small black dog ran out. Mr Oldcastle braked very hard and stopped with a big bang. The dog ran merrily on, but Gumdrop had a puncture. Mr Oldcastle changed the wheel and took the punctured one to be repaired. Meanwhile, the little black dog returned, sniffed the car, jumped into the back seat and went to sleep. Mr Oldcastle was putting the mended wheel back when someone licked his head. Off with you, he shouted, but the dog stayed put. Oh, I suppose we'll have to find where you live. You've caused enough trouble, you wretched, horrible dog. Horrible Horace. And Horace just wagged his tail. Mr Oldcastle looked at the address on his collar. It read, The Old Tin Mine, Trosoas. Mr Oldcastle got into the car and drove off. He asked some policemen the way. The sergeant directed them and said he would take them, but they were looking for a blue car in connection with some stolen watches. I hope you don't mean gumdrop, said Mr Oldcastle. Yeah, you don't look like smugglers to us, said the sergeant. So Mr Oldcastle searched for the old tin mine. They crossed a ford and the water splashed all over gumdrop, wetting his plugs so that his engine stopped. Mr Oldcastle lifted the back seat to get the spare set of plugs and was astonished to find a strange parcel. Mr Oldcastle was more astonished when he opened it. It was full of watches, a hundred or more. We must get these to the police. They must be the smuggled ones. He changed the plugs as quickly as possible and drove off. A car overtook them and stopped. Mr Oldcastle had to stop as two men got out. Uh, we are vintage car enthusiasts, said one. Can we have a closer look? Horace barked and bared his teeth. Mr Oldcastle was polite. I'm sorry, I don't have the time now, he said and drove off. We don't want people poking around Gumdrop. If they find the watches, they'll think we smuggled them. They raced off to find a police station. Suddenly, Horace barked. The car enthusiasts were waving at them to stop. I know that gumdrops are beauty, but this is ridiculous, said Mr Oldcastle. He saw a narrow lane, turned gumdrop into it, and hid behind a thick hedge. That's got rid of them, said Mr Oldcastle. Just then, Horace jumped out of gumdrop and ran on down the lane. Mr Oldcastle followed him, and there was the old tin mine. Horace raced in and came out with his favourite bone. Mr Oldcastle entered the building to look for the owner and stumbled over a large stone. Behind it was a glittering heap. There were watches, jewels and silver and gold. The smuggler's den, cried Mr Oldcastle. I shall certainly have news for the police. Just then, two cars skidded to a halt. The blue car with the vintage car enthusiasts, followed by the police car. We wish to search your car, the sergeant said. That's the car you're looking for, said one of the men, pointing at Gumdrop. So the policeman searched both cars and found the watches under Gumdrop's seat. Before you arrest me, said Mr Oldcastle calmly, look into the tin mine which belongs to these gentlemen here. He was so polite that the sergeant did so. Mr Oldcastle now realised what had happened. The vintage car enthusiasts were really the smugglers. They had panicked and hidden the watches in Gumdrop. Just then one smuggler grabbed the watches and they both ran, but Horace pulled one down and the constable caught the other by his collar. Meanwhile, the sergeant had found the treasure. He realised the truth and arrested the smugglers. Horace had belonged to the smugglers, but they'd cruelly turned him out. I suggest you keep him, the sergeant said to Mr Oldcastle. So it was how Gumdrop found a friend. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Josiah Oldcastle had a blue vintage car called Gumdrop. He would have loved to enter Gumdrop in a race, but it was too slow. We can still watch the vintage car race, he said. They had set off for the racetrack and stopped in a peaceful meadow for a picnic. How pleasant, thought Mr. Oldcastle, and he settled back to enjoy the hot sun. He was dozing off to sleep when Horace started to behave in an extraordinary manner. He sniffed around Gumdrop's controls, pushing and pulling. Stop that, warned Mr. Oldcastle, but Horace didn't, and zoing, the amateur case flew open. Now look what you've done, began Mr. Oldcastle, and he stared. There should certainly not have been a secret switch, but there was, labelled pot bark. Pot bark, shouted Mr. Oldcastle excitedly. Do you know what that means? It's short for pull out to beat any racing car, he said, dancing about. Gumdrop can go really fast now, and we can enter for the all-comers scratch race. And that's exactly what they did. Gumdrop stood at the starting grid among the fastest vintage cars ever assembled. The other drivers wondered why such a slow old car had entered, but Mr. Oldcastle thought, I'll show them. Then the flag went up, a horn sounded, and they were off. The cars thundered away, leaving Gumdrop a long way behind. Now was the time to act. Mr. Oldcastle pulled the pot bark switch. Gumdrop shuddered, his engine roared, and he leapt forward like a space rocket. In a flash, he overtook the other cars, and he won the race by six clear laps. The crowds cheered Gumdrop, but the other drivers were very angry. Impossible! Gumdrop's a fraud! Oldcastle's a cheat! they shouted. Mr. Oldcastle didn't wait. He felt guilty about the secret switch and drove quietly away. But that wasn't good enough for the angry drivers. They pursued Gumdrop up the road. Mr. Oldcastle turned Gumdrop into a side road, then across a field, but the other cars were catching up. Then he came to a river and no bridge! We shall be caught! cried Mr. Oldcastle. But Horace began to bark. He'd found a switch under the carpet, which said Pot Sorek. It means pull out to sail on rivers and canals, shouted Mr. Oldcastle. Horace pulled the switch and Gumdrop splashed into the river. Mr. Oldcastle gave a cheerful wave to the furious drivers who were left on the bank. Gumdrop chugged on like a motorboat, his big wheels keeping him afloat. This is the life, said Mr. Oldcastle. They sailed past amazed bargees on the canal until they came to a lock. Mr. Oldcastle heard excited shouts and saw that the vintage car drivers had again caught up. Mr. Oldcastle sighed, but just then Horace barked excitedly. Not another switch? asked Mr. Oldcastle. Yes, he had found another switch behind the battery, labelled Pot Flab. You clever hound. It means pull out to fly like a bird. Horace duly pulled the switch. Gumdrop's engine whirred like a helicopter, the silver wings on his radiator began to rotate, and Gumdrop slowly climbed into the air. Saved again in the nick of time, said Mr. Oldcastle. He gave the drivers a cheerful wave. As they flew over an airfield, they heard voices. Have you come to join our vintage flying display? asked a parachutist. What a funny aeroplane, said another. Then something dreadful happened. Gumdrop's engine began to sound like a lawnmower, then like a sick sewing machine, then like nothing at all because it had stopped altogether. Gumdrop began to fall. We've run out of petrol, shouted Mr. Oldcastle, and there's no petrol in the sky. He grabbed Horace and shut his eyes. When he opened them again, Horace was sitting beside him in Gumdrop in the hot sunny meadow just as before. It was a dream, exclaimed Mr. Oldcastle to his great relief. He hugged Horace. Horace was fine, Gumdrop was fine too, and there were no secret switches, which was just as well. They only caused trouble. After such an extraordinary dream, Mr. Oldcastle decided to leave the vintage car race well alone. So they turned back for home. Gumdrop's engine sounded once again like an Austin Heavy 12-4 engine should sound. Racing and sailing were not for him. And as for flying, Gumdrop was well content to remain firmly on the ground.
Mr. Josiah Oldcastle was driving Gumdrop, his trusty vintage car, when rounding a bend, he saw a battered sign. It was the entrance to a zoo. Let's go in, cried his grandson Dan. I love elephants. Mr. Oldcastle did too, but this zoo looked so dirty and decrepit. Dan insisted. Horace the dog barked excitedly, and so Mr. Oldcastle gave in. Inside it was even worse. The animals had cramped cages and looked hungry, cold and miserable. Bunbo the elephant poked out his trunk for food, and Dan gave him a bun. Stop feeding that beast, roared a voice. It was Barmy Big Shot, the owner, holding a gun. Horace snarled. Get that dog out of here and take that scrap heap of a car with you. We're closed, bellowed Big Shot. Mr Oldcastle was furious. Scrap heap indeed. He shouted back that the zoo was a disgrace and he'd get it closed. Barmy Big Shot fired his gun in the air and stalked off. Big Shot's really balmy, growled Mr. Oldcastle as he drove away. Suddenly, he braked hard and stalled the end. Bunbo had stepped straight through the crumbling wall and was galumphing away. It's Bunbo! He's escaped, said Dan joyfully. Let's go after him. But the car wouldn't start. Then Mr. Oldcastle honked Gumdrop's horn in a special way. Bunbo stopped and trumpeted back, sounding just like Gumdrop. Then he galumped back to the car. We've got to get away from Barmy Big Shot and find you a good home. You mustn't go back to that dreadful place, said Mr Oldcastle. He stopped outside a village, left Bunbo and fetched hay and buns. But Bunbo wasn't there when he got back and Horace was trying to tell him something. Just then, a police car arrived. A sergeant jumped out, told them that there was an elephant loose and then sped off. Where was Bunbo? Horace seemed to know. Behind some bushes they found him splashing in a pond. Dan honked Gumdrop's horn, called, Dinner's ready, and Bunbo came, dripping. He ate the hay and buns, and then they all set off again. Bunbo ran so fast they couldn't keep up. A farmer saw him coming, panicked, and jumped the hedge. Bunbo scooped up some turnips and charged on. Mr Oldcastle was dismayed to see the elephant grab some flowers from an old lady at the roadside. Bunbo raced on. Gumdrop stopped out of petrol. Mr. Oldcastle honked the horn in its special way. Bunbo galumped back to them and pushed them to a garage. Whilst Gumdrop was filling up, Bunbo helped himself to the vegetable man's fruit and vegetables. It was naughty. He saw a stream and stopped for a drink. At that moment, a huge truck lurched to a halt. Barmy Big Shot jumped out and fired his gun. You're a thief, he shouted at Mr. Oldcastle. I want my elephant back. You're a bully, shouted Mr. Oldcastle. You shan't have the elephant. Bunbo spurted a huge jet of water at Big Shot, knocking him over. Then he spurted the engine and stopped it. Well done, Bunbo, Mr. Oldcastle was impressed. We must be off before Big Shot dries out. They hurried off. We must find a home for Bunbo quickly, said Mr. Oldcastle. But blocking the way was the police car. The sergeant looked severe. Then Barmy Big Shot arrived. They were trapped. Officer, yelled Big Shot, that's my elephant. You'll have to give it back, said the sergeant, or you'll be under arrest. Oh, no, he won't, boomed a commanding voice, and everyone turned. It was Mr. Old Castle's friend, Sir Marmaduke Rickety Cobweb. Barmy Big Shot is under arrest for ill-treating animals. Yes, sir, said the sergeant, handcuffing Barmy Big Shot. You are also charged with having a gun without a licence. Come quietly now. Sir Marmaduke took Bunbo to Mildew Manor, and the others followed. He took the elephant to his safari park, where Bunbo met another elephant. Her name was Mambo. Ever since, Gumdrop regularly visits the safari park. The other animals from Barmy Big Shot Zoo are there too. Happiest is Bunbo, and Dan brings extra buns for him, Mambo, and their baby elephant. Then he honks Gumdrop's horn in its special way and the elephants trumpet back.
Mr. Josiah Oldcastle looked fondly at his very smart old car. It was a smart car, but to make Gumdrop the very smartest car, he needed a pair of silver wings to go under the thermometer. But no one made them anymore. Just the same, I'll go and search, said Mr. Oldcastle. Now you must drive a vintage car very carefully. So Mr. Oldcastle started the engine, looked around, signalled and moved off. Unfortunately, in the wrong gear, and they went backwards. You've knocked me bike over, shouted the postman. Mind where you park your bike, shouted Mr. Oldcastle. But they were both sorry. With your post, there's a copy of the highway code postman said. We both need a lesson in road safety, said Mr Oldcastle, and so they read it over a cup of tea. The next day Mr Oldcastle looked for the silver wings. Suddenly a fat man with a bushy beard ran straight into the road. Gumdrop stopped very quickly, lurched and burst a tyre. <laughs> Bang! Mr Oldcastle shouted, stop and look before you cross, don't cross between parked cars and don't run. The man had learned a lesson and was sorry but now Gumdrop had a burst tyre. Next day, Mr Oldcastle searched for the silver wings and new tyre. It was raining, and as Gumdrop approached a pelican crossing, the lights turned to green, but a man with a big umbrella ran out. Gumdrop skidded into a bollard, breaking a brass lamp. Mr Oldcastle roared. When the little man is red and the beep bleeping has stopped, don't cross and don't carry an umbrella in front of your face. Cars can't stop quickly on wet roads. The man had learnt a lesson, but Gumdrop had smashed a lamp. Next day was sunny. Mr Oldcastle now searched for the silver wings, a new tyre and a brass lamp. Suddenly three children dashed out from behind an ice cream van. Gumdrop turned quickly, crunched his front wing and splashed ice cream into Mr Oldcastle's face. Never, never, never run out from behind vans, he shouted angrily. The children were very sorry and had learnt a lesson in road safety. Next day, Mr Oldcastle was out again, looking for silver wings, a tyre, a lamp and a new front wing. He was tired of everything happening to Gumdrop and closed his eyes. He should never have done that, as he nearly hit a man on a pedestrian crossing. You careless old man, he shouted at Mr Oldcastle. You should have stopped and you've broken my car clock. Mr Oldcastle was sorry and gave Gumdrop's own clock to the man. I've learnt a lesson in road safety myself now sighed Mr Oldcastle. Next day, Gumdrop needed silver wings, a tyre, a lamp, a new front wing and a clock. Round the bend, a little dog ran into the road. Mr Oldcastle split the rubber bulb trying to honk the horn, then swerved the car. A van ran into Gumdrop's boot, bending the spare wheel, but the little dog was saved. An old lady ran after the dog. She was very grateful it was safe. Always keep your dog on a lead, Mr Oldcastle told her. At last he found the tyre shop. It was the man with the umbrella who came out. I want to thank you for saving me the other day, sir, the man said. We have a tyre and a wheel for your car. Allow me to present them to you. Then Mr Oldcastle went into the shop selling wings. The owner was the man Mr Oldcastle had nearly hit on the pedestrian crossing. We don't sell silver wings, he said. But we have a new mudguard, he said. And here is your car clock if you care to pay for the repairs to mine. Mr Oldcastle paid gladly and went out with a new front mudguard and Gumdrop's own clock. He then went into an antique shop where he instantly recognised the man with the bushy beard, who recognised Mr Oldcastle too. We found an old brass lamp and a new rubber bulb for your horn, he said. Permit me to present them to you for saving me the other day. As Mr Oldcastle thanked him and turned to go, he ran into the old lady and the little dog. Bless my soul, she said. I've been searching for you to repay you for saving my dog. She was fumbling in her bag. We should like to present Gumdrop with this. She pulled out a pair of shiny silver wings. Mr Oldcastle was delighted. When they got home, he fixed and painted the new front wing, fitted the wheel, bolted on the brass lamp, then screwed the old clock back and fitted the rubber bulb to the horn. Finally, he screwed the silver wings on top of Gumdrop's radiator. Gumdrop would be the smartest and safest car on the road.
one sunny fine morning, Mr. Josiah Oldcastle twitched his floppy moustache. Dan, he said to his grandson, let's go out today and visit Mildew Manor. It's very old and we might meet a ghost. Dan was not too sure about meeting shuffling, moaning ghosts, but he saw the bulging picnic basket and they would be going in gumdrop. I'm ready, let's go, he said. Mildew Manor was full of nooks and crannies. Don't worry, said Mr. Oldcastle. Hold my hand. If we see a ghost, I'll twitch my moustache and scare it off. They saw fierce-looking suits of armour, which Dan thought might leap into life, but they remained motionless. In the drawing room was a vast fireplace. Dan thought a ghost might slide down the chimney, but it didn't. Dan expected to see a ghost in the four-poster bed, but it was empty. There was a picture of Sir Crankshaft Rickety Cobweb. He loved cars, but was very forgetful. He lost a car on the estate one day. Fancy losing a car, thought Dan, a very odd man indeed. It was when they walked along a dark and shadowy passage that it happened, a swaying, shuffling figure gliding towards them. A ghost. It moaned and everyone shrieked and ran away. Mr Oldcastle stood firm and twitched his moustache. Once, twice, three times. A funny thing happened. The ghost stopped moaning, giggled, and then burst out laughing, took its head off and tucked it under its arm. Your moustache is so funny, I can't keep this up any longer. I'm Sir Marmaduke Rickety Cobweb, owner of this manor. Dan was happy it wasn't a ghost. Unfortunately, we don't have a ghost, explained Sir Marmaduke, but the visitors want one, so I have to pretend to be one myself. If I could find a real ghost, I'd give it a special room with a sign saying, This way to the ghost. When Sir Marmaduke saw Gumdrop, it was as if he had seen a ghost. What a beautiful car, he exclaimed. My Uncle Crankshaft would have loved it. Mr Oldcastle suggested that Sir Marmaduke come with them in Gumdrop to share their picnic. They drove to a hill on the estate. This is lovely. I haven't been up here for years, said Sir Marmaduke. They stopped Gumdrop and settled down for the picnic. Dan clambered into Gumdrop's driving seat, his favourite place. After the picnic, Sir Marmaduke practised being a ghost. He moaned and shuffled, and Mr Oldcastle twitched his moustache at him. Dan thought they were very funny and jumped up and down. In doing so, he must have kicked against the handbrake because the car started to move downhill. Stop! yelled Mr Oldcastle. Pull on the handbrake! Press the footbrake! Gumdrop was rolling faster. Dan was too short to reach the footbrake and needed both hands for the steering wheel. It was hard work and when they reached a steep bend, Dan was unable to turn quickly enough. Gumdrop rolled across a ditch and on downhill. Dan steered between some trees and bushes and with a little bump, finally stopped. Where have they got to? called Sir Marmaduke anxiously. I've never been in this part of the estate before. Mr Oldcastle found Gumdrop at last and was very relieved that they were not hurt. Dan was relieved too, although he was shaking a bit. Then he saw what they had bumped against. Look what Gumdrop has found, he shouted. A great big leafy, mouldy, mildewy, muddy, beautiful old car. Mr Oldcastle's moustache twitched so many times that his glasses fell off. Then he shouted, It's a ghost! Sir Marmaduke, come and see a ghost. Sir Marmaduke stared. This must be the car which my uncle Crankshaft lost all those years ago, and your clever gumdrop has found it at last. He calmed down a bit. Why did you call it a ghost? Because, my dear sir, replied Mr Oldcastle, this car is a Rolls-Royce silver ghost. And so it was that gumdrop had found a ghost for Mildew Manor, a lovely old car. It's on view at the manor, beautifully repaired and polished in its own room, with a notice saying, This way to the ghost. People come for miles to see this real and lovely ghost, and Sir Marmaduke has no need to shuffle around and moan any more. And on warm, sunny days, Mr Oldcastle and Dan drive over in Gumdrop to Mildew Manor. Gumdrop in front, the ghost behind, to the delight of all. <laughs>
one fine morning the postman called. I hope it's good news, said Mr Oldcastle, and it was. I've won ten thousand pounds! He danced for joy, and the next-door children joined in. Gumdrop's klaxon horn bleeped too. Mr Oldcastle's vintage car seemed to have joined in. It must have been a wiring fault. Mr Oldcastle pressed Gumdrop's brass horn for sheer fun. Honk! Honk! I can now buy the Rolls Royce I've always dreamt about. Honk! Honk! But that means shelling Gumdrop, said the postman. You can't do that, said the children who loved Gumdrop. Then Gumdrop's klaxon stopped, as if he understood. Horace curled in a corner and sulked. Well, I never, said the postman. They didn't like that, and he drove away. We want Gumdrop, chanted the children, and they scampered off. There was silence, except for a... <laughs> as Gumdrop's front tyre went flat. Next morning, Mr Oldcastle pumped up the tyre and set out to find a Rolls Royce. They arrived at Caristocrats. Mr Oldcastle jumped out and went in, forgetting to switch Gumdrop off. There, amongst a glittering array of Rolls Royces, was a 1926 Phantom One, the car Mr Oldcastle had always wanted. How much is it? inquired Mr Oldcastle. You can have it for £10,000, plus your old banger out there, said Mr Cardew Bender with an oily smile. Then he noticed Horace, and his smile faded. Horace seemed to dislike the rolls and had done something naughty against the tyre. Worse, he was now scratching the paintwork. Get that horrible dog out, roared Cardew Bender, just as Gumdrop backfired and blanketed the showroom in smoke. Mr Oldcastle got out, ashamed of Horace's bad behaviour. He couldn't understand Gumdrop backfiring. He paid for the damage and left, thinking that the Rolls-Royce would have been too grand for him. Next day he drove out again to search for a suitable car. The only modern car I would like is a Jaguar, he said. To think about it, he stopped for a coffee. Another car stopped on the slope behind Gumdrop. A new Jaguar. Mr Oldcastle went for a closer look, just as the Jaguar driver went over to Gumdrop. Beautiful! They both exclaimed at once. Let's swap, said Cecil Jaggers. Mr Oldcastle was tempted. Then something awful happened. Gumdrop had rolled backwards. Crunch, tinkle, tinkle. Jumping jelly beans, wailed Cecil Jaggers. Mr Oldcastle saw that Gumdrop's back end was mercifully undamaged. But poor Cecil Jaggers, his car's front end was crumpled like an empty Coke can. I've never seen such disgraceful behaviour, he cried in dismay. Mr Oldcastle apologised. I suppose it was my dog. He must have banged against the handbrake. He paid Cecil for the damage, but the deal was off. He thought perhaps the Jaguar was too modern anyway. On the third day, Mr Oldcastle saw a vintage yellow Renault called Reggie, which belonged to his friend Bernie Denton. Let's race back to my house for a cuppa, said Bernie, but Reggie was too quick for gumdrop. A quick vintage car would suit me, said Mr Oldcastle. I need a bigger car for my family, said Bernie. If you'd like, I'll swap Reggie for Gumdrop. Mr Oldcastle decided to try Reggie out, but when he attempted to drive Gumdrop into Bernie's garage, it wouldn't start, and so they had to push it. Horace sat behind the door and sulked, so Mr Oldcastle went on his own. So you've sold Gumdrop, said the postman disapprovingly. Where's Gumdrop, the children demanded. We want Gumdrop. Oh, so do I, said Mr Oldcastle, realising the truth. I must be mad to part with Gumdrop. Hop in, we'll go back. Bernie was waiting, looking cross. Your car has leaked oil everywhere. It then dawned on Mr Oldcastle. Ever since I've thought of selling Gumdrop, he's behaved oddly. Shorting wires, flat tyre, rolling backwards, not starting. He doesn't want to go. And that goes for Horace too. I'm sorry, Bernie, but I can't swap said Mr Oldcastle. Gumdrop is my friend. Of course he is, said the little girl. The mess on the floor, it's oily tears. Mr Oldcastle smiled. I'll keep Gumdrop forever. At that instant, Gumdrop's horn bleeped again. He seemed to have understood. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Josiah Oldcastle was very fond of old cars. He had a baby Austin 7, which lived in the garage with the green door. Next door was a garage with red doors, but it was empty. I had another car once, a blue vintage car with a black hood. I had to sell it, he told his grandson, Dan. I wonder where it is now. That day, he received a catalogue for a vintage car sale. On the first page was a picture. That's it, cried Mr. Oldcastle. It must be Gumdrop. And it was. Next day at the auction, many people wanted to buy it. The auction began, and it was soon Gumdrop's turn. People bid very quickly, and the price got higher and higher. At last, going, going, gone. And the auctioneer banged down his hammer. <coughs> Sold to Mr. Banger. I couldn't afford to buy it back, Mr. Oldcastle told his grandson sadly. Mr. Banger put Gumdrop in the showroom with all the new cars. People all looked at Gumdrop, but didn't buy the new cars. So he sold Gumdrop to Archibald Gridline, who wanted to race him. That car's not smart enough for me, Mr. Banger said. Archibald went to his garage, removed Gumdrop's hood, and took off the brass horn. Next day, he raced Gumdrop at Silverstone. They went roaring round the track, but the other cars went faster. Then there was a bang, and Gumdrop stopped. His engine was broken. Rocky Basher helped push Gumdrop back off the track. I'll buy it to race at the autocross, he said. OK, said Archibald. It's not fast enough for me. Basher repaired the engine, took off the wings and lamps to make Gumdrop lighter. Then he painted it yellow with green stripes. Next day, he raced Gumdrop, but the wheel fell off. <coughs> Bodger Prescott helped with the wheel. Will you sell it to me for a hill climb, he said. Rocky Basher agreed, because Gumdrop wasn't light enough for him. Bodger took off the windscreen, the running board, and the spare wheel. Next day, he entered the hill climb. All the cars roared up the hill. It was very slippery. Suddenly, a jet of steam came out of the radiator, and Gumdrop had to stop. Bodger was out of the race. Farmer Golightly brought a can of water to help Bodger. Will you sell it to me? It would help me on the farm, he said to Bodger. All right. Bodger said, it's not strong enough for me. Farmer Golightly took off the doors and the back seat to make more room for the hay and things he wanted to carry. But Gumdrop wasn't big enough, so Gumdrop was left in the farmyard looking a very sorry sight. One day, weeks later, Mick Mulligan came past. That'll fetch a pound or two at the scrapyard, he said. He managed to start the engine and drove away. He drove too fast, lost control on a bend and bumped into a car standing by the roadside. <coughs> It was Araminta, Mr. Oldcastle's little Austin car. He was mending a puncture and was very angry. You blundering nincompoop, he shouted at Mick Mulligan. Mick was frightened. I I'm sorry, I can't pay for the damage, he blustered. Tell you what, you can have the old heap instead. He then ran off. Gumdrop was not valuable enough for him. Mr. Oldcastle didn't recognise Gumdrop. It's an Austin Heavy 12 anyway. I'll restore it, he said to Dan and he towed Gumdrop home. Next day, they went to the scrapyard to look for spare parts for Gumdrop. Mr. Ebenezer Steen, the scrap merchant, said he had quite a few parts. Only the other day, Farmer Ghoul lightly brought in some doors and seats, he said. So Mr. Oldcastle piled all the bits he wanted on Araminta and went home. So the restoration began. They bolted on the wings, running boards, and windscreen. They screwed on the lamps and doors. They clamped on the hood and put in the back seat. Then they screwed on the spare wheel. Finally, they painted the body blue and the wings black. It looks exactly like my old car now, said Mr. Rollcastle. I wish it was, Gumdrop. He looked at the engine. Its number, all cars have special numbers, was C4478. The same, he shouted with joy. It really must be, Gumdrop. It is, said Dan, who'd found the old brass horn in the toolbox. It is, it is, it really, Gumdrop. They drove into town to take part in a vintage car display. Farmer Golightly gave Mr. Rollcastle the original number plates back. The mayor gave him a special cup for restoring the car. And all the people who had owned Gumdrop came especially to see him and to congratulate Mr. Rollcastle. <laughs>
The thing that Mr Josiah Oldcastle enjoyed best in life was driving his car. No wonder, because it was a very special car indeed. It was Gumdrop. He should have been enjoying himself today, but not on this motorway, the most crowded and smelliest of them all. At long last they turned off. This is much better, said Mr Oldcastle. They were going to stay with Sir Marmaduke Rickety Cobweb at Mildew Manor for the peace and quiet of his safari park. Suddenly, a bulldozer came out from nowhere and Gumdrop nearly ended up on the huge shovel. Really, this is too bad, said Mr Oldcastle. What's a bulldozer doing at Mildew Manor? Sir Marmaduke looked upset when he greeted them. I have bad news. A new motorway is to cross the safari park. Work starts on Monday. Mr Oldcastle was appalled. What would your animals think of a smelly motorway? Horace didn't like it either. Together they decided to act. First, a petition. Next morning, Gumdrop and Bunbo the Elephant collected so many signatures that Bunbo had to hold the long petition above his head. The giraffe helped too. By the end of the day, over a thousand people had signed their names. The next plan was to keep the bulldozers out of the park. They were huddled in a menacing bunch outside the fence, like beetles ready to crawl. Sir Marmaduke asked the keepers to bring all the big animals to join a picket line to face the bulldozers. So far, so good, said Sir Marmaduke. All we need now is something special to stop the motorway for good. He scratched his head but couldn't think of anything. But there was work to do. For the next two days, Mr Oldcastle and Gumdrop took huge loads of food for the animals. The weight made Gumdrop's wheels sink into the soft ground. On yet another trip, Gumdrop got stuck. The wheels kept on spinning, but Gumdrop just sank deeper and deeper. A keeper came to help. This is a job for the elephant. Bunbo was hitched up, and he pulled Gumdrop out. Mr Oldcastle looked at the deep rut Gumdrop had churned up. Something at the bottom glinted. What on earth could it be? Horace, he commanded. Dig, boy, dig. Horace needed no encouragement. He could smell something. He emerged from what had become a great big hole with a big bone. Mr Oldcastle, Sir Marmaduke and the keeper were staring, for in the hole was an ancient pot with gleaming pieces around it. Bunbo reached down with his long trunk and brought up the pot. Streams of coins poured out, straight into Sir Marmaduke's hands. They are ancient Roman coins by Jupiter, a treasure trove. Mr Oldcastle was excited too. Perhaps this was the special thing they needed. Sir Marmaduke telephoned his friend, Professor Octavius Shard, the world-famous archaeologist, who came straight away, complete with a television crew. His expert diggers got down to work, digging here, probing there, measuring everywhere. This is big, he said to the cameras. Not only more treasure, but a large Roman palace as well. A whole town, too, if my name's Octavius Shard. Unfortunately, said Sir Marmaduke, this site will be bulldozed on Monday for the motorway. Not if I can help it, declared Mr Oldcastle. Please lend me the treasures, the two petitions, and Professor, please come too. They jumped into Gumdrop and left immediately for London. The experts at the British Museum were so impressed, they acted at once. They raced across London to tell the government minister. The cameras followed it all, and that night it was on the television. Monday came, and so did the bulldozers. Gumdrop and all the animals faced them. My bulldozers must start straight away, said the chief engineer. The cameras waited for the battle. Stop, said a commanding voice. It was the government minister. He stood in front of the cameras, looking important. I have an announcement to make. This splendid vintage car, he pointed at Gumdrop, has made a big discovery, a major Roman site. As it needs careful excavation, I have decided to build the motorway elsewhere. A great cheer went up. Even the bulldozers hooted, for they were pleased too. Bunbo trumpeted, Bison bellowed, Hippo grunted and Horace barked. As for Gumdrop, his brass horn gave a triumphant honk. <laughs>
one sunny June morning, there was a strange sight in the Red Lion car park. A grand collection of vintage cars waiting to start their rally of the year. Each had a number, and there was a blue car with a black hood. It was number nine, driven by Bill McCarran and his wife Sally. It was Gumdrop. Mr Oldcastle had lent Gumdrop to them, especially for the rally. The organiser sounded his klaxon. <coughs> Follow the instructions and watch out for the signposts, he said. The first car with the lowest penalty points to arrive at Hyde Heath will be the winner. They left at minute intervals and soon it was Gumdrop's turn. Honk, honk. They'd driven for ten miles when they came to a crossroads. That way, shouted a young man. Thanks, said Bill, and turned down the twisty narrow road. Then they came to a gate. This can't be the way, Sally said. That chap fooled us, so they went back. Tootle toot, went the little hooter. Bill stopped Gumdrop. In the road was a small boy with a pedal car. I'm lost, he said. My name is Peter, and I live at Maple Tree Farm. That's the farm down the road, Sally said. I noticed it as we turned around. So they took Peter home. The farm animals were pleased to see Peter home again, and so was Peter's dad. He gave Bill and Sally a can of oil to say thank you. Then they turned round to look for the right road. They turned left, they turned right, and drove for miles. Then they heard a loud, Nay! It was a pony in a trailer. Our car's broken down, said a little girl. We've got to get to the jumping competition. Could you please take us? They hitched up the trailer and off they went. They arrived in time and the little girl won a rosette. Her father was so pleased that he gave Bill a set of sparking plugs for Gumdrop's engine. Oh, thank you very much, said Bill. Now we must look for the right road again. They found themselves in a crowded town with the bells chiming ding dong ding. It was carnival day. Gumdrop had got stuck in the procession with no room to turn. Then a man ran up. Uh, please, can you let the mayor travel in your beautiful car? His has got a puncture. I used to have a car like this, said the mayor. When they reached the town hall, the mayor thanked Bill and Sally and gave them his old instruction book for Gumdrop. Thank you very much, said Bill. Bill and Sally drove out of the town searching. Then they had to stop. The road was blocked by a tractor. Please help, cried the driver. I was on my way to market when the door of my trailer burst open and my piglets have scampered back to the farm. They found four piglets in the pond. Sally found three in a shed. Bill found two in a bathtub. And the last one was in a barrel. Then they took them back to the trailer. The farmer thanked them very much and gave Bill a set of vintage tools for gumdrop, which were in his tractor. Now we must turn round and look for the right road, said Bill. It really was getting late now. They came to a signpost which said Hyde Heath, where the rally was to finish. We've found the right road at last, said Sally. Just then they heard crackle, sizzle, crackle. The hayrick's on fire, shouted Bill, and there's no one there. He quickly turned Gumdrop round and went back to the town to call the fire brigade. They all raced back to the farm with Gumdrop leading the way. Clang, 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 clang. The firemen quickly put out the flames and saved the farmhouse. The owner had returned and was so pleased that he gave Bill and Sally a genuine vintage petrol can for gumdrop. Then they drove on. They were nearly at the finish when suddenly a motorbike appeared. It swerved and skidded and a parcel dropped from the back. It's that chap who fooled us this morning, shouted Bill. But the motorcycle had very hastily driven away. Bill picked up the parcel and they drove to the finishing point. All the other cars were there already. Then the klaxon sounded. The organiser announced, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we can't give out any prizes. They've been stolen. Bill remembered the parcel, and sure enough, in it were three shiny cups. Wonderful, said the organiser. We can award the prizes after all. Gumdrop didn't win a prize, but they gave him a brass starting handle for solving the crime. Everyone cheered and sounded their hooters. As they drove the car home, they knew that Mr Oldcastle would be very happy with all the presents given to Gumdrop.
One snowy day, a honk honk was heard in the high street. People stared at the old vintage car and some pointed at it. Some of them waved as they'd seen him lots of times before. A man shouted, That car must be an original Austin Clifton Heavy 12-4. It was, and it was gumdrop. Mrs. Maybridge explained to her daughter that Mr. Oldcastle sometimes lent it to Bill McCarran for special occasions. Bill McCarran was very proud to be able to drive Gumdrop with his shiny brass lamps and brass thermometer. He honked the horn cheerfully at some chickens by the roadside. They were stupid. They ran straight into the road in front of Gumdrop. Bill squeezed the horn again. Honk! sounded the klaxon horn. Grrrrp! and stamped on the brake. Screech! The chickens fled to safety, but Gumdrop skidded on the icy road and ended up in a snowy ditch. Stupid chickens, said Bill. He pulled and pulled, but Gumdrop wouldn't move. Farmer Hearn came out to see what the fuss was about. He tried to help too. Then he called Charlie the cowhand, Mr. Pudderfat the shepherd, Alf the odd job man, and Simon his son. But still Gumdrop wouldn't move. I'll get the farmer's friend, said Farmer Hearn. It was a sturdy steam traction engine, and when they attached a strong chain, it pulled Gumdrop out in no time at all. Bill examined the car, but there was no damage. Then he noticed that the shiny brass thermometer was missing. It was lost. He couldn't find it in the snow. You can't buy those anymore, he thought sadly. Some months later, Bill had borrowed Gumdrop from Mr. Oldcastle to pick up his wife when he came across the traction engine again. The farmer's friend was standing quite still. We've run out of water, said Farmer Hearn. There's a leak in the tank. They were on their way to the vintage car and steam fair. You repair the tank, we'll get the water, said Bill. He quickly fetched the water tender from the farm. Farmer Hearn filled up the mended tank and off they went. We'll get to the steam fair yet, he said. Bill meant to follow, but when he went to start the engine, Nothing happened. Then he realised that Gumdrop had run out of petrol. He couldn't catch the attention of Farmer Hearn. The traction engine was too far down the road. So Bill took the spare can and went off to find a garage. He met the driver of an old truck on the way. Can't help you, but there's a garage a mile back, growled the driver. Not a very friendly man, thought Bill, and walked on. The truck drove on down the road. Then the driver spotted Gumdrop. He stopped. That'd fetch a lot of money at the car auction, and that lad that owns it has gone for a long walk. He laughed at his mate. Without another word, they hitched up Gumdrop to the truck and drove off. When Bill at last returned with the petrol, Gumdrop was gone. That truck must have stolen him, he cried, and he ran back to the main road for help. There he saw a line of veteran cars coming from the fair. My vintage car's been stolen, he shouted. Jump in, said the driver of a de Dion bouton. But I can't go very fast. They chugged along. There they are, cried Bill suddenly. The truck was too fast for their old veteran car, but then it had to stop with its brakes squealing. Coming down the road and completely blocking it was a slow, wide, tall, stately machine. It was the farmer's friend back from the rally where it had won a prize. There was nothing the truck with gumdrop attached could do. It certainly couldn't turn round in a hurry, especially when there was a line of cars coming up behind with all the occupants cheering and shouting. The thieves leapt out of their cab and ran away as fast as they could go. Gumdrop was safe. Bill filled up the car with petrol and they were all invited to Farmer Hearn's for tea. In the farmyard, the chickens were pecking at something round and shiny. Farmer Hearn's son, Jonathan, picked it up and held it up for everyone to see. It's Gumdrop's thermometer, cried Bill. They must have found it in the ditch where it was lost last winter. So Gumdrop got his thermometer back, and the chickens got an extra feed that night because they had not been so stupid after all. Farmer Hearn brought out tea for everybody, and they all thought that it had been a really wonderful day. Bill wondered if Mr Oldcastle would believe all their adventures. <laughs>
There was once a car called Gumdrop. He was very old, and his proper name was Austin Clifton Heavy 12-4. He belonged to Mr Oldcastle, who kept him properly oiled and shiny. Mr Oldcastle went to live with his daughter in the town, but she had no space for Gumdrop. I shall have to sell him, Mr Oldcastle said sadly. However, I'll take off the brass horn to keep. So Gumdrop was sold to Mr Pluggett's garage. An old crock like this isn't much use, said Mr Pluggett, but someone might buy his instruments. So he took them out and sold them separately. Gumdrop was left out in the yard. Nobody wanted to buy him. One day, two burglars ran into the yard, running away from the police. This old crock will do, said one. No one will miss it. So they started the engine, jumped in, and were off down the road. Now, an Austin Clifton Heavy 12-4 is difficult to drive. Gumdrop lurched from side to side, the brakes and gears making dreadful noises. Then, in the middle of the road, they saw a policeman. I can't stop, said the driver. With a sharp squeal, a big crunch, a loud bang, a gurgling hiss and a dull clang, Gumdrop went straight into the window of Mr Moppet's greengrocer's shop. Crash! The policeman walked up and arrested the two burglars. Gumdrop was towed away, and as Mr Moppet tidied up the shop, he was surprised to find two brass headlamps. I'll hang them up outside the shop, he said, and that's what he did. The police sergeant was a kind man. He knew a good vintage car when he saw one. But we can't keep you here, he said. The superintendent doesn't like old cars. However, we would like to take out the engine and battery to drive our cement mixer. And that was exactly what they did. Poor Gumdrop. Mr Oldcastle had kept his brass horn, he'd lost his instruments at Pluggett's, his headlamps at Moffat's, and now his engine and battery had been taken out. That afternoon, a lorry came and towed him out to a field full of scrap metal of all sorts. For weeks, Gumdrop stood amongst the scrap metal. One day, Mr Zachariah Rosa, a gypsy, saw Gumdrop in the field. Just what I want to tow behind my caravan with all my extra bits in, he said. So he bought Gumdrop for a few pounds, mended his tyres and towed him away. Next day, a motorcycle frightened Cherry, Mr Rosa's horse, who bolted. The caravan fell into a ditch, breaking its wheels. The Rosa family wondered what to do. We'll take off Gumdrop's wheels and use them, said Mr Rosa. Then Gumdrop, without wheels, was left alone in a field. But not for long. Mr Alfred Blops, a tramp, cleaned up the seats and slept in Gumdrop at night. One morning, as Mr Blops was getting up, a man appeared. I'm a vintage car enthusiast and I have been looking for such a car to rebuild for next year's vintage car competition. My name is Bill McCarran. Would you sell your car to me? Mr Blops accepted the money, although he'd lost his home, which he'd kept so clean. So Bill collected the car in a lorry and took him home. He straightened the dents, polished the sides and his wife mended the hood. After weeks of work, Gumdrop stood shining good as new. But he had no wheels, no engine, no battery, no lamps, no instruments and no horn. I can't find these things anywhere, said Bill. They don't make them anymore. While searching one day, he saw the two brass lamps outside the greengrocers. When Mr Moppet heard that Gumdrop was being rebuilt, he quickly agreed to sell them. Bill went to Mr Pluggett's for some wire, and he told him about the instruments he'd got, so Gumdrop got them back too. The police sergeant had no more need for the engine and battery, so they were returned, and he told Bill about the scrap merchant. Mr Brett, the scrap merchant, told him that Mr Rosa had the wheels. He'd got a new caravan, and so Gumdrop got his wheels back. And so Gumdrop, fully restored, was driven to take part in the vintage car competition. There were many fine cars there when they arrived. The judging began, and two men looked all over Gumdrop, made notes, and then went on to the next car. Later in the day came an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, the first prize goes to Mr Bill McCarran. The people cheered Gumdrop and the prize was given to them by none other than Mr Oldcastle, the president of the club. Not only did he give Bill the cup, he also gave him the shiny brass horn he'd taken off Gumdrop all that time ago. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Josiah Oldcastle, his trusty vintage car, Gumdrop, and his grandson, Dan, were at the seaside on holiday having a picnic. It was raining, and they were miserable. Never mind, said Mr. Oldcastle. Cheer up. Imagine it's sunny. He knew Dan was good at imagining things. Dan imagined the sun was shining, just like in his exciting book about a pirate called Black and Dagger. He looked up. The sun was indeed shining. And there were Mr. Oldcastle and Horace in the warm sunshine. Dan ran down to the shore. Then he jumped. Look at that! A huge pirate ship had appeared, just as in Dan's book, and it was coming straight towards them. Pirates! cried Mr. Oldcastle. They look nasty. Quick, back to Gumdrop. The pirates were pouring ashore, led by Captain Black and Dagger. But they saw Gumdrop and fled, thinking he was a blue sea monster. Captain Black and Dagger would have run away as well, but he fell over his sword. As he staggered up, his eye patch fell off, and then he could see Gumdrop with both eyes. It's a horseless carriage, he thundered, as the other pirates advanced menacingly. Stand clear, warned Mr. Oldcastle. My carriage has an engine under the bonnet. He revved the powerful engine, and Gumdrop made a fearful noise. The pirates were so frightened by the sound that they ran off again. I shall keep my engine under control, provided you keep your thieving fingers off my car, offered Mr. Oldcastle. The pirates promised to behave, and the captain introduced his men. The tall one is Titch, short one is Lofty, bald one is Fuzz, and Pegleg's got a Pegleg. He then gave his hat to Dan. Now, we must collect our buried treasure, or our deadly enemy, Captain Rattlesaber, will get it. Let's take them in gumdrop, said Dan and Mr. Oldcastle agreed. Titch was tallest, so he acted as lookout. Suddenly he cried, Ship on port bow! Shiver me timbers, roared Captain Black and Dagger. It's that villain Rattlesaber. After him! But there was no one to be seen. They've gone after me treasure, wailed Captain Black and Dagger. But I don't know which way. He'd lost his map and forgotten the way, so he burst into tears. What's this? asked Dan. A parrot's feather, cried Fuzz. There ain't no parrots here, said Pegleg. Rattle Sabre's got one, said Skinny. Horace will find the way, exclaimed Mr. Oldcastle. Horace smelled the feather and was off. He hated parrots. After him, cried the pirates. Tally-ho, parrots away! Horace knew which way the parrot had gone and streaked ahead. Suddenly he stopped. The bushes parted and out came the parrot sitting on Captain Rattlesaber's shoulder. Two of the fiercest pirates were carrying a huge treasure chest. My treasure, yelled Captain Black and Dagger. Stand and deliver. He jumped from gumdrop, tripped again, and fell in a heap with his men. <laughs> Horace charged straight at the parrot. Get away, bad boy, squawked the parrot. Too fat to fly, she ran. She reached a hole in a tree just in time. Horace sat and waited. Captain Rattlesaber and his men were frightened. The car was bad enough, but they hadn't seen a dog in years, and this one looked vicious. Captain Rattlesaber burst into tears. I want my parrot back. I've had her for 40 years. I tell you what, Captain Rattlesaber, exclaimed Mr. Oldcastle. Give half the treasure to Captain Black and Dagger. I'll call off my dog, and you can have your parrot. As Captain Rattlesaber loved his parrot, he agreed. Captain Black and Dagger agreed as well. After all, half the treasure was better than none. They agreed to be friends. Captain Black and Dagger was very grateful. Mr. Oldcastle accepted a gold coin from the treasure chest and a bottle of brandy. Then the pirates left for their ship. Mr. Oldcastle poured a brandy and let Dan have a sip. Dan just couldn't imagine what brandy tasted like. Just like orange juice. They were back at the seaside having a picnic. The rain had really stopped and the sun was shining. There you are, my boy, said Mr. Oldcastle. I told you to use your imagination. Or was it just imagination? When Mr. Oldcastle tidied Gumdrop up, he found a brandy bottle, a gold coin, and a pirate's hat. <laughs>